All right, so today we're going to be doing an enzyme lab. Uh, we're just starting our enzyme unit, so some of this will be kind of new information and you'll get to kind of see how things work uh, before we jump into all of our details. Uh, what we'll be using today is yeast, which is what you could just grab at the grocery store. This came straight from the grocery store. And then also some hydrogen peroxide, which you would also just get at like, you know, CVS or something. Um, this is only 3% hydrogen peroxide. It's the stuff you would put like on a cut if you had one. Um, so it's not super strong, but it's definitely going to um, give us the reaction that we're looking for today. So some background information that you need to know is that in yeast, there is an enzyme called catalase, and it works on the substrate of hydrogen peroxide. And when the enzyme works on hydrogen peroxide, it actually breaks it up into water and oxygen. And what we know about oxygen is that oxygen is a gas. And so when that gets produced inside of a liquid, it'll actually kind of make these bubbles, um, which should cause the thing that is in yeast, which is going to be filter paper in this case, to actually rise to the top of our liquid. So we'll be able to kind of test the fact that this enzyme is working by seeing how quickly our filter paper that is dipped in the yeast rises to the top. Um, what you need to know to kind of fill in your introductory information is that we'll be using four different concentrations of hydrogen peroxide today. So we have 3% hydrogen peroxide, which is the one that came straight out of the bottle, but I moved it over so that it kind of looks the same. Um, next, we have 1.5% hydrogen peroxide that we'll be testing. Then we have 0.75% hydrogen peroxide. You're probably sensing a pattern. I just cut them in half. And finally, 0.375%. So you're gonna to wanna to fill those in on your table where it says that there's four different solutions um, that you're using. Fill in those percentages that I just gave you and then take a minute to uh, read the background information and fill in your pre-lab questions and then we'll come back and do the procedure together. Welcome back. Now we're going to start our procedure. Uh, just so you guys know some background about what I've already done for some of our lab setup. I did already make our yeast solution because that does need to sit for maybe five minutes or so to kind of activate the yeast because dry yeast is kind of dehydrated and so you put it in some water to kind of activate it, get those enzymes going again. I've also already pre-filled many of our test tubes that we'll be using. So these are 15 milliliter test tubes um, and I measured in 10 milliliters into each of them of the appropriate solution. So you can see here, I labeled them. You should always label your test tubes when you're doing a lab. So here I labeled this one as 3%. This is a 3% solution and I labeled it as number one. So this will be my first trial. I'll show you guys kind of how I did that. I have one test tube that I left empty. So what I'm gonna do is get my appropriate solution that matches my label. So 3% and my 3% solution. And I'm going to grab this pipette. So maybe you've heard the word pipette before and maybe you've heard the word micro pipette before. Micro pipettes are much smaller. Um, these are obviously the larger pipettes for larger volumes. So we want 10 milliliters. So I grabbed one of the larger ones because it'll be much more efficient. So all I have to do is put the pipette into my solution and then I kind of twist this knob up here and that kind of sucks up the liquid. And so I'm going to make sure that I grab 10 milliliters of my solution. There we go. And then I can go the opposite direction with the um, kind of scrolling circle up here and get all of that into my test tube. So pretty simple. Um, this is how you would measure it out if you needed to in class, uh, any kind of thing that you want precise amounts. For this lab, it didn't actually really matter how much I put in, but it's definitely important that we have consistency because what we're gonna be doing is timing how long it takes for the filter paper to rise to the top of the liquid. And so if we had all different levels, those times would not really be able to be compared to one another. So I wanted to make sure that we had the same amount in all of our test tubes. Um, our next step in our procedure is to cut out our filter paper discs. I've cut out a couple for you, but I just want you to see kind of how I did it. So I grabbed a piece of filter paper and a hole punch, pretty simple. And I can just punch out a couple of these filter paper discs. Pretty easy. 
The next step in your procedure tells you to kind of dip the discs into the yeast for about five seconds or so, and then let it kind of sit on the paper towel to let extra liquid kind of drip off of it. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll dip all 12 of my discs in, and then I'll let them sit and we'll get started with our actual trials. I made this yeast solution pretty concentrated so that I know that it's definitely getting enough yeast on it. So if you look at your procedure, it said like one teaspoon for 200 milliliters of water or something like that. And um, it doesn't need to be that precise. Oh, I dropped one. I'm not even gonna bother grabbing that. As long as you know you're getting yeast onto your filter paper, you should be all set. What you've probably noticed is that everything in this lab is something that you could grab at the grocery store or the convenience store. So you could definitely do this lab at home. It is safe. Um, it's just, you know, the general hydrogen peroxide and yeast that you would get. But I didn't want to force you to go buy those things. So I'll do it for you. This is the boring part when you're getting yeast onto the filter paper. So far I have four because I dropped one. So I apologize for the fact that you now have to watch me do this. What we'll be doing once I get all of my filter paper in yeast is putting them on the lids of my test tubes. Um, so this makes it so that I can kind of control when the hydrogen peroxide actually touches the yeast spheres. Um, if I put it on the lid of the test tube, then what I'll end up doing is I'll flip my test tube over and when I flip the test tube over, that's when the hydrogen peroxide will actually kind of hit the um, filter paper. And that's when I can assume that's when the reaction is starting. Uh, if I was kind of trying to place the filter paper at the bottom of the test tube, it might be kind of difficult to um, know when the reaction is starting. The timing aspect of it would become a little bit trickier. So this should be pretty easy in that we'll put it in the lid, I'll close it up, since the filter paper is wet, it'll kind of stick to the lid, and then I can just invert my test tube, and then I'll start my timer. And I will stop my timer when my filter paper gets to the top of my liquid. I have not been counting. Ooh, 13, okay. So we're gonna start with the 3% solution. So when you're filling in your data table, make sure you start with the 3%. And we're gonna do three trials of all of our concentrations. So we'll do three trials for the 3%, three for the one and a half, so on and so forth. So I'm gonna grab one of my filter papers. I'm gonna put it on the lid, make sure that it sticks. Hopefully that sticks. Let's see. Oop, it's definitely not sticking. Hang on, let me try another one. I need to re-dip this in the yeast, we'll see. All right, I think this should be okay. So I'm gonna put the lid on. It's kind of stuck to the lid right now. I'm gonna flip my test tube over and I'm gonna start my timer at the same time. And I'm watching for my filter paper to rise to the top. There it goes. You might not be able to see this, that's okay. All right and it has reached the top. Oh my gosh, 12 seconds exactly. Look at that. So for 3%, the first trial was exactly 12 seconds. Now we'll do our next one. As these kind of dry off, it becomes a little bit harder to make sure they stick to the lid. So I might have to kind of dump them in the yeast again at some point, we'll see. Oh no. We're okay. We're just gonna use a new one because it almost fell in. All right, trial two for the 3%. This one's going way faster. I probably put more yeast on it. 7.62 seconds. We 
Yeah, so these are mostly drying out. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of dip a couple of them in the yeast again, just to get them a little bit wet so that they stick to my lid. And I'll blot them dry a little bit just so that they're not covered in yeast, but this should help them to stick better. So this is trial three for my 3%. Reset my timer and flip. goes and it's at the top wow 12 seconds again pretty consistent so the middle one was a little bit faster that's why we do three trials and we'll kind of average them all together once we get to that point so you're probably getting an idea for how this procedure works and now we are doing a lower concentration of hydrogen peroxide so what i want you to think about is in theory the enzyme concentration should be the same between all of my trials, because that's what the yeast is. Um, but I'm changing the concentration of the substrate, the thing that's getting broken down. And as I get less and less concentrated of substrate, I want you to think about what might happen to the time. All right, so we're gonna do trial one of the one and a half percent. So I have less substrate, less material that can be broken down by this enzyme. So I want you to think about, should it take more or less time for those gas bubbles to be produced? And it reached the top at 14.41 for this one. All right, trial two for the one and a half percent. So we saw in the first trial that it took a little bit longer than the 3%. Um, think about if this makes sense to you and what you might expect to happen as we get smaller and smaller in concentration. 14.8. While you're kind of waiting for me to do this and thinking about it, I would also like you to think about what might you be able to do to make this reaction go faster. So we know that as our concentration is going down, it seems to be taking a little bit longer. I don't know, maybe I don't actually wanna to have to wait 30 seconds or something for this to happen. So what concentrations might help me to kind of speed up this process? So I have 14.14. So we've done our two highest concentrations. So kind of make a hypothesis in your head right now about what do you think is gonna to happen to the time as I do my lower concentrations? And maybe in your head right now, you're thinking this is about to get pretty boring because it's gonna take longer. Maybe I should have started with the lower concentrations first. Sorry. All right, so we're on trial one of my 0.75% hydrogen peroxide. Now, since this is like an actual experiment, right, there's always room for error. Something could happen. We might have a fluke in one of our trials. That's okay. That's why we take an average of all three of my um, trials. All right, 18.39. That's not too bad. All right, so we're on the second trial of the 0.75%. I'm going to flip it over, start my timer, and see how long it takes. So I need to wait for it to rise all the way to the top. When I flip it, sometimes it like moves around a little bit. That's just because of the fact that I'm like flipping it into liquid. So it kind of like pops up a little bit and then comes back down. Um, but I'm waiting for it to actually like rise to the top because of the bubbles. So this one was 16.78. And my final trial of the 0.75, let's 
see how long this one takes. Reset my timer. There it goes. And 16 seconds on the dots. So this might remind you a little bit of a lab that you might have done in general bio with photosynthesis, where you had little um, circles of spinach leaves and you had them in um, baking soda and you saw those rise to the top too, um, also because of the production of gas. Um, actually also because of the production of oxygen gas. So that's kind of an interesting little connection here, right? We use the um, production of gas a lot to kind of measure how well a reaction is working or how quickly a reaction is working because it's one of the easiest things to actually see, right? We can see gas bubbles being produced. Um, we can't really see other, a lot of other things being produced. All right, we are now onto our final concentration. So that's the 0.375, our lowest concentration. And we are on trial one. So hopefully you have an idea that this is probably gonna take a little bit longer than the other ones. We'll see what actually happens. It seems to be just kind of sitting at the bottom right now. It is quite possible too that you can eventually reach a concentration where maybe the reaction doesn't happen at all because there's just not enough to produce enough oxygen. We might be there. We'll give it some time though. Hmm, this is taking a while, huh? So I will say in the past when I've done this lab, this one doesn't typically take this long, but um, there's some like kind of room for error there and some things that we could think about. I'm starting to see oxygen bubbles now. They're like just forming. Here it goes. So we can kind of talk about in class why maybe this one is taking so much longer, um, but Wow, a minute and 24 seconds, just over a minute and 24 seconds. That is quite some time compared to our other ones. We'll see if it does the same thing on our second trial. So you can see the oxygen actually being produced when you're like looking at it as close as I am. And what we saw with the 3% was that the oxygen bubble started getting produced almost immediately. Um, and with this one right now, when I'm looking at it, it just looks like my filter paper is just sitting in water essentially. I don't see any gas bubbles. I would have no idea that there was yeast on this. Um, there's just not much happening. And it took till almost a minute on the last trial for us to even get any oxygen bubbles produced, which is pretty long if you compare that to the rest of our trials. Um, let me see. I'm starting to see a few, couple oxygen bubbles, and we're at 43 seconds. So definitely a lot longer. And so we're gonna talk about kind of why this is happening and what these different concentrations of substrate um, might mean in terms of like how effective my enzyme is. Um, We'll also time to talk about what other things we could do to change the rate of the reaction. Uh, what would happen if I put a ton of yeast on here or barely any yeast? Oh, here it goes. All right, a minute 14, a little over a minute 14. There are definitely other things that you could kind of adjust for this lab to test. We only are testing different concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, but you could also change the, um, oh, I grabbed the wrong tube. 
You could also change the temperature of things. Um, you could kind of see if any other things would cause a reaction, any other types of substrates. Um, they would hopefully only work with the correct enzyme, but you could definitely test other things. All right, here's our last one. So keep in mind that we're only doing concentration on this one, right? So we change the concentration and we change the concentration only of the substrate. When you do an experiment, it's really important that you kind of only change one thing at a time. That way, any differences that you do see, you can link directly to that thing. So any changes that we see in the time here is going to be directly linked to the fact that we changed the percentage of the substrate and nothing else. We don't want to change two or three variables at once because then who knows, maybe it's because there's more yeast or maybe it's because the temperature changed. You don't want to be moving around lots of different things at once. So it's really important that you only change one thing at a time. This one seems to be moving a little bit faster. Fifty-seven seconds, so a little over fifty-seven seconds. So write that value down on your table. And now you should have twelve different values written on your table. You should have three for each of the concentrations. You'll find on your data table that you're going to be doing a couple of um, calculations. You're going to be having to average the time, and then you're going to figure out what the rate of the reaction is. It's laid out for you on how to do that calculation. Next, you'll be creating a graph, and you're going to graph how the rate of the reaction changes as we change the concentration of the substrate. And then you're going to be writing me kind of a conclusion paragraph about how these changes um, happened, what did we actually manipulate in the lab, and then also what does that mean? So why does that happen? Or what are some other things we could do in the future, future experiments to test similar ideas with enzymes? Uh, so go ahead and kind of make sure you have all your data written down. You can go back in the video if you need to get any of those values again. And then start on your calculations and then jump into your graph and your conclusion. Thanks.